Hi everyone, my name is Travis Steffens and I'm the Regional Director for Ontario Nunavut of the Explorers Club. Um, we're here today with a one of our meetings. We usually host our, have our meetings hosted at uh, Kensington Tours in Toronto. Unfortunately, with uh, with the global Thanks pandemic, so we're switching to to um, to uh, online virtual meetings. And uh, I'm excited to introduce you a speaker, uh, but uh, we have a few things I want to say beforehand. First, I want to thank uh, Joe Gabrowski from Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, who has kindly hosted this event. And uh, his organization has, bringing, has been bringing researchers, uh, scientists, explorers, and conservationists to children around the world through uh, virtual events just like this. So he's operating the technical side of this tonight. Um, I also want to thank Kensington Tours for the continued support of the work that uh, we do. They uh, have been uh, integral to the club in Toronto and across Canada um, and across the club in the US as well. Uh, and they've provided us kindly with the place to host our meetings uh, when we have them face to face. And we always want to thank them for their, for their gracious um, generosity and their efforts to help sort everything out. Um, I just want to uh, introduce uh, George, who's our chapter chair. He's got a few things he'd like to say. Um, and then afterwards, I'll introduce our speaker who will, who will then um, discuss some, some fantastic, uh, a fantastic topic, and then we'll have some question and answer afterwards. Hey, George. Thank you, Travis. Good evening, everyone. I'm George Karunas, the Canadian chapter chair, and I hope everyone is having a, uh, a good time not exploring or at least hopefully planning expeditions or at least thinking about planning expeditions. I know I personally am supposed to be in Iceland right now. And of course I'm trapped at home just like everyone else is. And uh, that's just par for the course. But that doesn't mean that exploration is completely off the table. Since our last meeting, there have been a couple of historic monumental uh, events in the realm of exploration, not necessarily Canadian centric, but worth noting nonetheless, the first ever commercial company teamed with NASA, of course, sent two astronauts into space, Bob and Doug. How's it going, eh? I couldn't help. As soon as they, whenever they mentioned their names, I was always thinking of Bob and Doug McKenzie in my, in the back of my head. And uh, the first time ever a private company has sent anyone into orbit. So that, that is just, I, I was watching the launch. Uh, it was very exciting, tremendous, perfect launch uh, after that weather delay that they had. So that was pretty amazing. But also not just exploration of outer space, but exploration of inner space as well by an astronaut. Uh, Kathy Sullivan, some of you know her as an astronaut, American astronaut. She was the first female astronaut to ever do a spacewalk. First female American astronaut, I believe, to ever do a spacewalk. Well, she has conquered the deep seas as well. She just got back from being the first woman ever to go to the bottom of the Mariana Trench aboard the uh, Victor Biscovo's uh, submarine, the, the limiting factor. So they just got back and they brought a club flag with them. So there's another example of tremendous exploration, great uh, feats being accomplished even in these times. So you know, salute to them, to everyone who is still able to get out there and do these amazing things. And I know there's juggernauts of big corporations behind some of these like SpaceX, et cetera. But still, it's, uh, it's exciting for me to be able to see that there's still stuff going on out there even during these times. And we're just wrapping up Oceans Week, the Explorers Club heavily involved with that, Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants heavily involved with that. So even though it was all staged virtually, it's still the show must go on, as they say. So it, it did indeed. So I hope some of you, or, or hope, I hope all of you, at least got to indulge in a bit of the Oceans Week programming that the club put on. Um, in other news, uh, there hasn't been much going on in terms of club news, obviously, because there hasn't been much going on. However, the uh, discovery grant process is still proceeding very well. We've had quite a number of pre-applications come in. The actual um, full application form is not quite available yet. The finishing touches are still being put on that. 
but the pre-application is uh, certainly up and quite a few of uh, members and some non-members have already started that process. So the committee, uh, there's gonna be an announcement very soon about who's on the committee. It's a, a series of scientists and some media specialists who will be working together to filter all these applications, do some due diligence to make sure that they meet criteria in terms of scientific relevance, in terms of ethics, um, and of course, usefulness for television, right? Or for media. So there's, there's a, a number of criteria that, there that have to be filtered before they even reach the desk of anyone at Discovery Channel. And even though the official announcement hasn't been made yet, I will give you a bit of a, a inside scoop. I am one of the members of that committee. So the Canadian chapter will have a, a toe in that water. So we'll have a, a certain amount of say in terms of uh, what, uh, what happens there in terms of what gets the Discovery Channel. So that's very exciting for me personally to be involved with a tremendous group of people from around the world who are gonna be vetting these applications. And uh, I look forward to uh, helping the club put out there the best that we have to offer. So that's really, really exciting. Uh, if anyone has any questions about the Discovery Grants, feel free to reach out to me. You can email me or give me a phone call if you get my contact information is on the club website. Um, in terms of if you have a project you want me to, to talk, you want to talk about or anything like that, if you have any questions, just let me know. I can hopefully help you out. Now, in terms of today, we have Matthias Breiter. Um, Travis is gonna do more of an official introduction, but I wanna share a few anecdotes. I know Matthias well, I consider him a good friend. I sponsored him for the club. And we met a number of years ago, six or, six, six or seven years ago, I would say, uh, on a ship going through uh, Greenland in the Northwest Passage. He was on board filming some polar bear material for, I believe it was the Smithsonian Channel. And uh, I was on board with uh, Mark Robinson, who's also uh, a member of the club here in the Canadian chapter, and we were working on a project for the uh, for the Weather Network, and we became fast friends. And uh, it was just it was an amazing trip. We spent an entire month on this ship, and then later on, about a year or two later, we uh, Peter Rowe and I brought Matthias on as part of the team to film an episode of Angry Planet on polar bears up in Northern Manitoba and how climate change is affecting the polar bear, that specific polar bear population. And I believe he's got a, a, a few stories or at least a, a video clip from that particular uh, shoot that we did together. So it's an absolute delight to, to see him again. I, I always love spending time with Matthias as infrequent as it is. And I guarantee you're in for a treat. His, his, his bear knowledge in general, B-E-A-R, is uh, second to none, his photography is second to none, and it's a delight to have him in the club and speaking tonight. Travis, back to you. Thank you, thanks, George. Yes, no, it's a real honor. Um, Matthias was uh, recommended as a, as a potential speaker, and I have actually never received so many recommendations for a single speaker um, up to this point in, the, in many years I've been doing this. Uh, he's a fellow of the, uh, the Royal Canadian Geographic Society of the Explorers Club. He's actually one of the founding members of the International League for Conservation Photographers, which I recommend people check out because there's amazing photography uh, and the work they do is incredible. Um, he's authored uh, 20 books. I think it might be over 20 books if we include the newest one coming out and has had his work published in National Ge Geographic, BBC Wildlife, amongst many other notable um, um, outlets. Uh, his latest book, Grizzly, I've had a sneak peek at, and it looks incredible. If anyone loves wildlife photography or understanding bears or anything like that, you're going to very much enjoy this. So make sure you pick up a copy of that. Um, today, Matthias is going to talk about his work with polar bears and how looking through, um, through looking at these bears through a different lens, um, pun intended, uh, is helping to shape how we understand these majestic creatures. And I know I'm very excited to hear more. So without further ado, welcome Matthias and thank you very much for, uh, for spending uh, time with us in the club here. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, Travis. And uh, I just wanna add to George's uh, story about being up in the Arctic together. The result of us being on the boat for three weeks was that we were encouraged by the expedition leaders and the captains to actually not sit together anymore because too much havoc aboard. 
So for any future expeditions that really bodes exceedingly well. Anyway, um, I today uh, will talk, try to give you a better understanding of polar bears, which for like a Canadian chapter is uh, such a fitting subject as there is 25,000 polar bears worldwide and about two thirds of them live in Canada, like every single territory, uh, Nunavut and four provinces have resident polar bear populations in Canada. Uh, there's 19 subpopulations worldwide of polar bears, 13 of them live either entirely in Canada or partly in Canada. Um, last year I was all over the Arctic, uh, up to 80 degrees north, I was in Svalbard, uh, Greenland, Ellesmere Island, Devon Island, Baffin Island, and it was the first time ever that I really felt hot wherever I went in the Arctic. So the climate change is certainly happening and it's not happening gradually. It seems to be leapfrogging right now. And so for the polar bear, what we do in Canada and how we interact with bears, how we are able to coexist with bears here in Canada will very, very much influence their survival, whether they make it long-term. I mean, there's gonna be major threat to the bears in Canadian uh, territory. This includes shipping like the Northwest Passage. There's mining interests, tourism interests, uh, fishing interests. I mean, there is major potential for conflict. And for us to understand polar bears better is, will be crucial for coexisting peacefully. So uh, my polar bear, work or my bear work goes back 35 years, as you can tell from my accent, I actually didn't grow up with bears. I grew up in Germany. I spent basically my entire adult life in Canada or North America, but as a child, I was in Germany, did an undergraduate work in Germany, and then went to, uh, got a scholarship for graduate school uh, in Massachusetts and started working already in graduate school with bears and that was grizzlies. Now I'm just gonna show you, start with a couple of images. Um, and it was first in Montana and then up in Alaska and grizzlies really fundamentally had the same image problem that polar bears have today. 35 years ago, grizzlies were considered unpredictable, considered hazard to people, potentially a man killer. Basically everything we think of polar bears today, this has changed somewhat. Um, and it changed for people learning more about grizzlies in the field. And I went then in the uh, late eighties up to Alaska because I wanted to learn more about social behavior and grizzlies. And uh, early on, everyone told me I could not work with the grizzlies out in the field unless there was a salmon run and the bear had much too much to eat and wouldn't be interested in people. But any other work was highly hazardous. And I then started to have a history of really doing what people told me I shouldn't do. And I started camping out with bears during the mating season. I was studying mating season among bears, among grizzlies. Uh, I was with them at a denning time where people said, well, they would be highly aggressive as they're in dire need of getting more food. And really could show that all of this wasn't really true. They weren't terribly aggressive that you could work with them on land and that you could uh, interact with them, be safe with them and study their behavior without interfering. Uh, this then also became then uh, scientific work for me. I worked for my PhD on then bear aggression and particularly infanticide uh, could show that infanticide had really nothing to do with reproductive success, but was opportunistic predation. But all of this resulted in that I got invited by the late 1980s to work on polar bears, and that was first in Hudson Bay. And for me, this was highly interesting as polar bears and, and brown bears are very closely related. In fact, they can still interbreed. Uh, as you probably have heard, there have been bears interbreeding, there have been a number of cases documented, but this has happened all through uh, bear history, like polar bears as a dis uh, distinct species has been around for about a million years, but there has always been uh, interbreeding between brown bears and polar bears when there was an overlap in territory. 
And so when we have interbreeding today, it has really little to do with global warming. The very fact of interbreeding where it happens may have something to do with climate change, but not that it happens. And what I wanted to see was like, in what way do polar bears are, are different to brown bears and what way are they the same? Um, like there would be a number of, of very similar traits, but where were the differences? And so just to try to get a little bit into like where bears come from, where bear evolution comes from, like polar bears evolved from brown bears from an isolated population in Siberia. And uh, bears in general, brown bears were like predisposed, physically predisposed to actually inhabit Arctic environments, simply as the Arctic uh, has highly seasonal resources. And this is what bears are specialized in. Bears are specialized in utilizing seasonally rich resources, put on a lot of weight, put on a lot of fat, and then live off your fat reserves through the lean periods. And that can be just because they munch a little bit on vegetation, it can be hibernation. But this is basically the adaptation. So uh, bears are carnivores, but they soon moved away from this typical hunter carnivore, like a cat or a, a dog, to become these specialists in utilizing localized rich resources. And with that came certain adaptations, like they also used more vegetable matter, their teeth became wider, they had a bigger muscle uh, uh, development for smashing food, like uh, carnivores have uh, a so-called jaw lock, so they can't laterally move their lower jaw, so they can't grind down food, they have to smash it, which then results that uh, like bears have this pronounced skull ridge where they, these jaw muscles attach to as well. And it also results in that some bears have exceedingly wide faces, which makes them so attractive to us, such as the panda, a purely vegetarian bear. Uh, so there were certain predispositions that brown bears had to actually evolve into a, a polar bear, this adaptation to be able to use seasonal resources. And then there came further adaptation. And one further adaptation that is very noticeable in any polar bear is the enlarged nasal cavities. And this is not for having a better sense of smells, like bears have an exceedingly good sense of smell. Uh, a, a polar bear can smell prey from a mile away. It can smell like a sea layer through seven feet of snow. Uh, but the enlarged nasal cavity has really to do with water retention. Like when we inhale through the nose and exhale through the nose, the air gets warmed up or cooled down through a nasal cavity. And in a polar bear, the result is that they basically don't lose any water through exhaling. A human being that uh, is out in the Arctic at 40 below has to drink about a gallon of water per day just to stay hydrated. A polar bear uh, doesn't really lose any water, so they don't have to drink, which uh, in the Arctic in the winter is a big problem to the availability of water. For we always see it as easy because there's snow around, there's ice around, but this has to be melted. And melting snow and ice into water takes up a lot of energy. Bears, polar bears are primarily about energy conservation. And so actually to have a large nasal cavities, less water loss is purely an act of energy conservation. Other uh, aspects that are really then important in the water uh, issue is that bears recycle nitrogen waste. Like we constantly rebuild our bodies. Uh, so we, our bone density is impacted, how much we actually use our body, our muscle tone is impacted. We constantly break down muscles and then rebuild it again. And in bears, these rebuilding is all done through recycling. So a bear that goes into the den, like a brown bear or a female polar bear going into maternity den, she will break down muscle tissue, but she will rebuild it internally without any external stress. So that they lose only about 5% of the muscle tissue, even though they are six months basically immobilized compared to a person that has a cast on within 72 hours, they will suffer from muscle atrophy. Uh, so the important part here is if you have to excrete nit nitrogen waste, you have to add water. So we have to drink water just to get rid of our nitrogen waste. Polar bears don't need to do that. They recycle it. 
They also, that means in the diet, an adult polar bear can live basically off fat. They don't have to eat muscle tissue. And uh, the result is, again, you get not just more energy out of it, you don't have to excrete nitrogen. So polar bear life is entirely about energy conservation. It also matters a lot how they hunt. A lot of hunting, particularly when it's cold, is still hunting. Uh, they do not try to run too much. It's, it, it being most efficient matters for survival of a bear. So then there's other aspects, other, other adaptations of polar bears to the environment. Polar bears are primarily marine mammal hunters out on sea ice. That's where they get the majority of their food from. A polar bear that has a choice, except for like a female going to maternity den, will spend the entire life on sea ice if they can. There are some bears that really never come to land. And for living out on the ice, they have evolved certain characteristics. One is, as you can see in a polar bear, they're very pale colored, like milky white. Uh, they have clear guard hair and uh, kind of a creamish white undercoat. Uh, it insulates reasonably well, but uh, the, most of the insulation actually comes through the fat layer. They have a dark skin that will soak up uh, sunlight and it may help a little bit with thermal regulation, but that probably is mostly helpful for cups, not so for adults. Uh, there is always the urban myth that uh, the guard hair, the clear guard hair redirects ultraviolet light towards the skin, but it is just that it's a myth that actually isn't true. So when you look at a polar bear, like here from, you see the Roman nose that enlarged nasal cavities, but you also can take a look at the feet, uh, much more fur than a brown bear. Uh, they have little papilla on the soles of their feet that helps or prevent slipping. Their claws are much, much shorter than in a brown bear, much more curved to give them traction on ice. And if you compare the feet, uh, polar bears are hugely wider. Uh, this has two reasons. One is they ate in swimming. Polar bears are just absolutely magnificent swimmers. They can swim for hours and days on end without tiring. They can swim at like six miles an hour uh, continuously. Like someone in a kayak trying to outdistance a polar bear really has its work cut out. It's not easy to stay ahead of a swimming polar bear. But the other thing is also weight distribution. Uh, like a polar bear, adult polar bear weigh, weighing a thousand pounds can stand on ice that is too thin for an adult human to stand on. There are other physical characteristics for polar bears. When you see the top image, the long elongated neck that makes it easier for polar bears to breathe when swimming. They're more pear shaped. So when they're swimming, they glide easily through the water. So the entire physics of a polar bear is very much around an aquatic lifestyle, which is also why they're called Ursus maritimus. They live on the ice, they live in the ocean, swimming is for them natural. And, and they swim differently than a brown bear. Like you see the one on the, the bottom, that's a, a female that followed the cups out onto the ice and the ice was very thin and she fell through. And you see her dragging her hind legs and just working her front legs just to, to spread out her weight with her hind legs and then pull herself onto more solid ice. When swimming, they're similar. They spread out their hind legs and only paddle with their front legs, uh, similar to seal that just uses the front flippers. It seems to be a much more efficient way of swimming. They're so well insulated that uh, to get rid of excess seed is actually a problem for a bear. So this bear is not just trying to relax. This bear is actually trying to cool off. He was playing just recently. And the only places where they really can get rid of bodily heat is in their arm and leg pits where there's capillaries right underneath the skin and there's no fat tissue uh, serving as an insulating layer. Uh, so for polar bears, it's actually immensely problematic to get rid of heat uh, if they run far, faster than five miles an hour for any length of time, a healthy polar bear will overheat. Inuit people used to hunt them by simply walking them down. They could not escape on land from a person walking at a brisk space, pace. Um, so when I first worked in, with polar bears, then in uh, on the Hudson Bay coast, like I was interested in behavioral stuff. I, mean, I wanted to interrupt. How they, what's that? I sorry to interrupt. I think these slides aren't showing on the uh, on the screen. There it might have to be um, 
uh, share screen on the on the bottom there again. Okay, I have to do that. I'm sorry. I'll see. I'll see how I get this. Okay. Well, it says tells me that I can't share right now while the other participant is sharing. Yeah, um, Joe, would you mind seeing if you can switch that over? Okay, whoever is sharing, I just turned it off. Okay. Perfect. Can yeah, we can see it now. Okay. What I don't see, Joe, uh, is where I could uh, get the video. It doesn't show me where the where yeah. I could uh, optimize video performance. We may have to do that later then. But anyway, I'm sorry about that. I already went through like ten images, and I may just go back and just add a few words, and then go back to this image. Okay. No problem, guys. Thank you. All right. This was about maternal protection in brown bears. Um, now we go polar bear here. Uh, this is kind of the evolutionary history of polar bears, um, brown bears being the closest relative. And here we have a skull with, uh, this is a skull that I actually found on Fox Island in Hudson Bay and it was an old male. And the amazing thing with that whole, there was the whole carcass of the polar bear was there, uh, that the hip was, that, that bear had suffered a very bad hip um, injury, broken hip, and it had totally grown over. There was bone growth all over the hip. So that bear had lived for several years with a hip injury that should have really immobilized him, but he obviously survived for years. And it must have been ex excruciatingly painful for that bear. And uh, it's amazing what kind of conditions, what kind of pain these bears can live through. So this is then polar bears out on the sea ice, how we mostly would like to see them. This is a sow with cups out in, in Lancaster Sound. And here, let's like to get you some more look at the polar bear's feet. You see uh, the dark pads there. This is where the little papillas are on, so to prevent slipping. Here, uh, just some comparison. If you have the, the grizzly feet and the polar bear feet, and the bottom left is, is polar bear and the top right is, is grizzly, that there is actually quite a difference, like polar bear feet being considerably wider. Uh, and not as elongated. You see the claws are much, much shorter, more curved to actually get a hold on ice. Um, here, polar bear, you see the long neck that is quite noticeable that, and just makes it easier for the animals to breathe when they're swimming. The pear-shaped form and the female at the bottom, how she is trying to get herself back onto solid ice, dragging her hindquarters. Um, this year is a, a polar bear then resting, trying to cool off. Um, as I said, it's, it's for them very, very hard in, uh, to actually stay cool, even in conditions that are like well below freezing, they overheat easily. And so uh, we're back to the image where I was just with my talk. I apologize that, was, that none of the images were on your screen until now. Um, what I was mostly interested in, like you can read up on morphology and it explains to you why bears behave the way they do behave. But I really like to see social interaction. And so early on when I worked in the, the Churchill area, 
basically what you saw was big males or juvenile males. You wouldn't see much else. And there was some social interaction, some aggression. This here is actually a male that is the carcass of another bear, probably juvenile, um, which, well, is kind of a morbid fascination, but that was the only aggression I ever saw among bears of any significance in, in 20 years. It certainly will happen more frequently, but it is not as frequently as you would expect. What you see much more often is actually social behavior. And uh, any one of you has been at church with buggies, you, you would see possibly quite a bit of play action. Uh, there was even social behavior in the old days that uh, now doesn't exist anymore because Brian Ledoon has passed away and really the dogs are not anymore there where they used to be and there's no feeding of the bears happening anymore. But he used to feed bears and they would hang around the dogs and there would actually be socialization between the polar bears and the dogs, which to some degree the most striking thing for me was always that what in the world possessed a dog to actually want to have anything to do with three polar bears that outweigh the dogs like 10 to one. Um, but I basically never saw any interaction uh, females with cubs or females with other bears. And so when the opportunity arose to go to other places like there were cabins in the area that just were away from the town site, um, I was able to then also observe other behavior and I, I could be then on level ground with the bears. It certainly changes entirely your perspective. You see bears differently, you see the behavior differently, you analyze the behavior differently if you feel you're actually on like a level playing field. And uh, even if there's like a fence in between you, you kind of feel more vulnerable and you observe differently. And this here is a female defending her cups against the male. Uh, behavior quite different to a brown bear. Uh, polar bears hiss, so this, they don't actually roar, they hiss, so there will be a very defensive hissing going on. And also what you get with uh, sows defending cubs, as a rule, the cubs, in the picture before, they were just outside the frame, but the cubs stay with the female. This here is another female defending her cubs against the male, and they just stick right together. Like in brown bears, uh, the, the cubs, if the female gets into an argument, the cubs will run off. And black bears, the cubs will be sent up a tree. But in polar bears, the safest spot is right at your mother's side, and that's where the cubs are. And then also, I pretty quickly uh, got very, very curious bears that I sometimes had to uh, kind of discourage. Uh, this one was a, a a yearling that had way too much interest in me, and I didn't want to pepper spray him or I didn't want to get a really negative association. And I ended up slapping him on the nose to get him to back off and that worked fortunately. So early on all my polar bear work was in the fall. That's when the bears waiting for the sea ice to form. But then I wanted to see a little bit more and the opportunity to arose to go to the denning area. And in uh, Manitoba denning area, also Ontario denning area, the denning area of polar bears is in the forested zone all over the Arctic. Otherwise, uh, there are no trees, there are no forests where polar bears den, which has the result that the den melts over the summer. And even though polar bears are generally faithful to a denning region, but not then to a den site. In Manitoba and also on, in Ontario, that is not the case. They're actually the dense sites are in the root system and they persist from year to year and they get reused by polar bears. Some of them have gotten reused for 300 years. They could determine on growth rings of trees that this was an active den for, for 300 years. That makes it possible for us to actually go to dense sites, wait at dense sites for bears to come out and watch their behavior, analyze their behavior. And this here is a den site that just opened. You see there's a couple of tracks right in front of the, the den site. Uh, the cups have never been out of the den. So this is, for me, I always wondered how this actually felt to cups. They look out of the den, they see a big wide landscape and then a couple of people a hundred yards away, but still it's kind of a striking image. So these cups will have never seen any life outside the den until the day before. And uh, so, it's, it's fascinating. The only bears that den up are fe pregnant females. They have to enter the den. 
like bears have a very unusual, well, from a human perspective, unusual reproductive cycle. They will mate in spring, polar bears, it's an April, May that they're mating. And then if the, the mating is successful, the ovum is fertilized, the uh, uh, fertilized ovum will develop into a state of plasticist, which is uh, a spherical sac about the size of a pinhead. And at that stage, the plasticist has to implant into the uterus wall and the placenta has to develop for the fetus to grow. Uh, in bears, this stage of implantation is delayed and it's delayed until the female goes into the den. And it probably the, there's a hormonal connection that as the female doesn't enter the den, the pregnancy aborts. Uh, it is not entirely proven. There's strong suggestions how this is connected. Uh, like the, the plasticist to get reactivated for implantation, it depends on estrogen. Uh, estrogen is excreted uh, probably because of, it was linked to a prolactin exc excretion. Prolactin is a hypothalamus hormone. Uh, I personally believe that there is a link between prolactin excretion and the uh, hibernation inducing hormone. Uh, that actually triggers the implantation. So in other words, this is a probably a female doesn't go into the den, uh, the pregnancy will abort. So for polar bears, this has pretty drastic consequences. Like a polar bear female comes off the ice in, in Manitoba in, uh, in Ontario in July. She will get into the den by late October. The cups are born in December. And then she comes out of the den again, late February, early March. And that means she's up to nine months with basically no food. Nine months just living on fat re reserves, just on the bodily reserves. So it's a very, very harsh life. And this is also where then when we look at the future of polar bears, this is where uh, polar bear populations will start to suffer. So when people talk about that, we still see healthy polar bears, so the polar bears don't have any problem. This is not what we should look at. This is not where polar bear numbers are indicated to go down. It's recruitment, uh, whether we see cups and whether we see juveniles. If we don't see cups, if we just don't see juveniles, that's when the population is under threat. Seeing healthy bears does not really give you a good indication. So when, they when they're born, the polar bear cups are about two pounds in weight. Then they grow into the den on the mother's milk uh, until they're about 20, 25 pounds, and then they leave the den. Some polar bears, females will come out of the den and head straight for the sea ice, they're just gone. Others, they build a day den nearby because the environmental conditions are quite extreme. They, in the den, it would have been around freezing. They come out of the den, it could be 30 below, 40 below. This here is a day den that was actually then built the next morning right to the den site that had the image before. And then the polar bear females will head out towards the sea ice with the cubs. It's often hard, hard to follow. Like we tried to follow them, we wanted to see how the journey is out on the ice, are there conflict with other bears, etc. But as you can see, like in, in this image, they easily just vanish behind a little snow ridge. So unless you have deep snow where you can see the tracks, they can be really tough to follow. Generally, the females with the cups will scoot across open areas and then rest again in like little tree clumps. And for protection, initially I was wondering what really the protection was all about. And it turns out it was, it's wolf predation. They actually are quite susceptible to wolf predation. Mostly they have two cups. Sometimes they have three. And brown bears, you have more often three cups or even four. Uh, I personally, my opinion on that is the reason for that is that a polar bear has four active memory glands. Uh, brown bear has six and a cup needs two memory glands to actually fill its needs. So that means the four active, two cups get their share. The third one will always be pushed away. So as a rule, the third one is always the runt. In this image, when you see the, the cup sitting right on top of the bear, it's almost invariably the runt. And runts usually don't make it. I actually have never seen polar bear yearlings uh, that are triplets. I've only seen twins. So I've seen a number of cases, triplets leaving the den, but never yearlings. So here you see the runt is right below the mother's face. You see the, the torn 
uh, either. So the squabbles between the cups can be quite severe. And even though females will defend the cups against any outside uh, danger, they actually will not interfere in squabbles among the cups. So the cup has to take care of itself. Though it was often then regarded that this can be very well intrusive unless you stay far enough away. I only try to work with bears that are actually tolerant and don't try to avoid you. But it's not dangerous as they don't really want to have anything to do with you. In all these years, I had one polar bear female with triplets that actually came up to us. That was just one female out of hundreds that I've seen over the years. And we were following her uh, for quite a while. We never saw her and then thought, well, she's gone. She's out on the ice. We, it's just, we don't want to chase her. So we stopped and had lunch and all of a sudden we saw this bear coming towards us. So she backtracked on her own tracks, came towards us, walked around us and then settled about 30 yards away. And when we looked where she came from, there were two wolves behind her. So she was trying to avoid wolf predation by actually hanging around us. And she stayed in around us for the entire time, for the entire rest of the day. Um, next day she was gone. We don't know what happened. I, we assumed that the, chooks, that the wolves had taken off and looked for something better to eat. Uh, but my interest then grew more and more what, what are actually polar bears also doing in the summer. The initial concept was that polar bears in the summer, they come off the ice, they would just lie somewhere and wait until the ice forms. They wouldn't eat. There was research suggesting that there really was no terrestrial food that polar bears were ever eating. But I had watched bears scavenge like moose, uh, not moose, um, goose carcasses like from hunters. I've watched them feeding on kelp while kelp is marine, but there's no there would be no reason why they would eat kelp, but not other vegetation matter. So I was really intrigued what is actually happening in the summer. I, like that an adult male or a female that was really in a, in a very healthy stage like this female here, she doesn't have to look for food for several months. There is no need to do that. Uh, she loses about two pounds a day resting, but uh, for a month or two, there is no need to look for food. They, 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 their body weight might be 60% fat by the time they come off the ice. So, but what about juveniles? What about sows with cups? They don't have that much of resources. They must be doing some feeding. And all the information available suggests that that, that wasn't really happening. And I mean, there's food sources out on the land like grizzlies very, very heavily prey like on caribou calves. But within two weeks of birth, caribous can outrun a grizzly. They can outrun a polar bear and they calve in early June. Polar bears don't come off the ice even in Southern Hudson Bay before early July. By that time, uh, like moose calves, caribou calves are well, can well easily outrun any predator. Uh, Six six, the, the Arctic ground squirrel. I actually have never seen polar bears pursue them, uh, possibly because the Hudson Bay shore is just too gravelly for the north. There are no six six. Um, so it's very much a grizzly food source, but I've never seen it with polar bears. Uh, there are were reports that polar bears were raiding goose colonies, eggs. However, it was very isolated cases and uh, they are the same problem as that when the goose, when the geese are sitting on the eggs, the polar bears are still on the ice. The ice usually doesn't leave Hudson Bay and further north even later until July. And by that time, the geese have a long, after the chicks have long hatched and are almost inaccessible. So I was trying to see what bears were doing and I ran almost immediately into problems. And the problem was that the bears were avoiding us with all means. They would just take off uh, any vehicle coming, helicopter, plane, the bears were just gone. And there was just no real feasible way of, of observing them. Way. And one noticeable thing with the polar bears, when they were avoiding you, they all went for water. Water is their safety. So whereas like other bears will run into cover, they run into bushes, all the polar bears, they run straight out towards the shoreline they jump into the Arctic Ocean and swim off. That is their safety zone. So we decided that this was just not really a feasible way of, of watching polar bears. 
that the best way was that uh, going up to somewhere the shore, uh, along the shoreline, make camp, and uh, far enough away from any town site that we wouldn't get garbage bears and these kind of problems. And from Inuit, I've heard of one point of land sticking out into Hudson Bay, but there's always some bears hanging out. And so we were dropped off up there and we pitched a tent, put an electric fence around it and was hoping to see some bears. And oh, within an hour, we had a very young bear going by and uh, just checking us out and then moved on was a small bear, not a problem bear. Then the next couple of days, we saw some other bears just moving by. None of them hung around. None of them ever showed really any interest in us. Uh, there was a big Arctic tern colony. That we had one bear that moved past our camp uh, while attacked by Arctic terns. He never showed any interest in eggs there either. So we had no real indication what were these bears doing before, beyond moving on. There was no bears hanging around us. They just kept walking along the shoreline. We assumed looking for floats or something. Well, then we had a big storm coming up and that big storm uh, well, blew up down our tent, ripped our tent. We had to fix uh, the tent pole the red green way, putting duct tape around it. And so after the storm had cleared, um, we, there was no way for us to leave the island. We had no boat available. Uh, there was uh, also the, the wave action on Hudson Bay was much too high. And so we were standing there in front of our camp and watched the polar bear female walk by us and then she was uh, about 200 yards by us and all of a sudden turned around, walked back into the wind and then dropped behind a few rocks. And she stayed there for two hours and I was wondering what was going on. And at that point, we didn't dare leave our little tent compound. The electric fence was our barrier. And so we didn't want to go over there and check what this polar bear was doing there. And uh, it was just about hundred yards away from our tent, but not visible. And about two or three hours later, the polar bear left. And so we decided to move over and see what is there. And what we found was actually a dead beluga, which caused me to get quite nervous. My experience with grizzly was that if you have somewhere a carcass that is worth defending, you will have one big grizzly on it and you will have a lot of unhappy grizzly around it that don't get to feed on that carcass. So there would be high potential for aggression. And we had now our camp a hundred yards from a dead beluga. And I expected to have in short time, a lot of polar bears there and most of them unhappy. And within two days, we had 20, 27 polar bears around camp. And, uh, but it didn't turn out to be at, at all aggressive. What we actually had was more like a party. There was up to seven polar bears feeding at the same time on the carcass. There was even between bears of very different size, there was no aggression at all. What you see in this image is the far back images is a huge male. Like the largest male that it was ever hunted was 2,200 pounds. This front bear is a reasonably sized male, probably eight years old. It probably weighs at this time of year, 800 pounds. The one in the back, uh, I mean, this is camera condensing, is easily a 1,500 pound bear, possibly more than that. And he could hardly walk. He would walk like 20 feet and would sit down and like was just visibly exhausted, would rest for an hour and walk another 20 feet. When he walked by our tent within 10 yards, he wouldn't pay any attention to us, none at all. It was like we didn't even exist. Uh, and with us, with the bears being so tolerant, uh, we started to walk among them. We started to realize actually it was possible to move among them, photograph them without getting charged, without getting attacked and all of that. And the only bear, and to this day, it's the only bear that was ever aggressive was this male. And I always kept an eye on the horizon where the wind was blowing for new arrivals. And this bear showed up and all this body posture, the whole thing, I, I felt uncomfortable as soon as I saw him. And when he saw us from about a mile away, he started charging at us. So then the only thing I could think of was charge him. So I charged him, he would stop, he would go sideways and he would charge me again. And I went back and forth until the bear was about 10 yards from us. So we had a shotgun for self-defense, which obviously we didn't want to use. And I told uh, 
my friend that was with me, I said, okay, if this bear doesn't back down, down now, we have no other choice. Uh, please try to hit him and miss me. I'll give it a last try. And that's when the bear gave up and then actually never showed any interest in us after that at all anymore. He somehow connected our being with the smell of food and he thought where we are is where the food is. And when I later on showed that image to uh, a game warden in, in Churchill and he said, oh yeah, this is so-and-so. They knew that bear, they actually had flown him out because he was a trouble bear. And so we actually had run into a town bear. And this was the only bear, the only polar bear in 20 years walking with polar bears that ever showed any aggression. And most of it, it was intense social behavior that we saw a lot of play action, uh, a lot of tolerance for other bears, bears of hugely different size, interacting, playing. And uh, well, I, I got the opportunity of a lifetime to take images and including this one. And when I showed this one to Smithsonian Channel, Smithsonian Channel then hired us to actually do a film on polar bears in summer to show what their life would be. And uh, so we had a two seasons, one season, uh, the first season I actually was and also with George up on uh, in the high Arctic doing some filming off the ship. The second season was entirely Hudson Bay and I had to bring my own boat into Hudson Bay, which was an adventure in itself. Uh, to get it down the Nelson River, like we tried to put it on the train, but the train derailed, so there was absolutely no way of getting it to Churchill unless we put it into the Nelson. The Nelson was in flood, which was our savior, as we could actually get it across the shoals. We made it to the mouth of the Nelson uh, and then drove all the way to Churchill, and I believe we were the first boat in a hundred years that made it from the Nelson River to Churchill. So it was it's just not done because it's such problematic waters in Hudson Bay. You can't get nowhere to shore. Uh, there's no protected base. From our time on the island, I knew behind that little island with the flowers and the polar bears, there was a little a holdover that even at low tide would have a few feet of water where I could put the boat in. And that was the goal. And that's at, at a very calm tide, I could get in there and, and be set there. And we had the boat there for two months. And it was a huge eye opener. It changed my entire perception about polar bears. We saw sows of cups going by, sows of cups going like swimming by the boat within five feet. Uh, we could do underwater stuff with the bears. They, they were exceedingly social. They, we had, we did discover there wasn't just these few bears that were walking by the island. There was, no, we had a Zodiac with us so I could paddle over to another area. And just out of sight from our tent camp from two years earlier, there was always 15 polar bears hanging out and they were socializing nonstop. And it was then also very, very noticeable that on two days we had boats coming by. Once was uh, Inuits that came, went from Arvia to, to Churchill. And as soon as the boat noise was audible, the, the polar bears would just vanish. Like they literally would take off, they in, like in a panic. And I had like one tour boat from Churchill that came by once during that time. And before the boat was visible, all the bears took off. So when then the people arrived on shore, they saw nothing. And what he would film, we had bears roaming around us 30 feet away, not a single aggressive bear, not a single bear trying to uh, like threaten us or avoiding us in two months. But that boat sound was enough to drive them all away. And so we were able to see and document behavior that people actually hadn't seen before. And it is now what, what I also will show you in a couple of video clips. It is not that this is now totally new behavior by bears. I think it's mostly that people have not seen it, watched it because all what we do or what most tourists do, what research is doing is mostly rely on vehicular access and the bears just simply take off, they avoid us. And uh, so we don't see a lot of that behavior. And so we followed the bears all the way into fall uh, until the bears basically went back out onto the ice. And we saw them behavior berry eating, they would eat gooseberries, cloudberries, a lot of crowberries. And then also what we observed was actually moose hunting. We never saw them taking down a moose, but there is a moose rut in that area where we were in the fall. 
uh, there was 10 bears always hanging around the river mouth and we couldn't quite figure out what the bears were doing there until we realized this is where the moose rut is. So all these bears were hanging around where the moose were and we have never seen them taking down a moose, but grizzlies do after the rut, the uh, bulls are totally exhausted. So it's not certainly out of the possibility that they would, but there's also wolves. There's a healthy wolf population and uh, bears most certainly will scavenge and wolf kills. So it's, it's, it was a highly, it was an illuminating time to spend out there with the bears, uh, see behavior that nobody had witnessed, uh, also been able to document uh, behavior and interaction that nobody has seen before and dispel some of the myths. So this is a moose from the area. And what I wanted to show you now is uh, a few footage sequences that we took for that film. And it's actually, you can watch the entire film on Smithsonian channel, it's called Polar Bear Summer. This here is the entrance sequence. Polar bears are the undisputed monarchs of the North. They are born for life on snow and ice. But there is one place on earth that challenges our image of the animal. Hudson Bay. Here, polar bears spend their summers on land. But what does a marine predator stranded ashore do all summer long? The large males, the families, the juveniles. What do they eat? How do they survive? At a time when summers are growing longer, these Arctic specialists must find a way to adapt. An unknown side of the animals emerges while they are landlocked, but is it enough to give the polar bear a chance to survive in a warming Arctic? So just said you realize um, all these socializing bears, these are all adult males. So socialization uh, among adult polar bears, it's, uh, it's quite astounding. That really wasn't known to that degree. And then here we have some feeding behavior. Polar bears are thought to eat only blubber and meat. But on Hudson Bay, they broaden their diet. Here, they eat berries, lots of them. It's unknown whether they eat them for nutrition or to simply fill their stomachs during the long, hungry summer. So meanwhile, like we have seen it more often, I've been up on Baffin Island and I've watched sows of pups eating for days just on, uh, on low bush cranberries. So there certainly is a nutritional value to it. But until we actually filmed it, it was still regarded that they don't eat terrestrial food at all. Um, we have then also, meanwhile, watched polar bears actually hunt belugas in the summer. They would sit on rocks at river mouth and when the belugas would come in with the tide, they would jump on the back of belugas. It was basically all big males that would do this type of hunting, but we have witnessed several cases when they were successful. And also, meanwhile, I've been up to the high Arctic and I've watched similar behavior uh, on Ellesmere Island. So with that, what we, with all that time I spent and with the bears uh, out on Hudson Bay on, the, well, walking around it, um, I started to like try to make people understand that interaction with polar bears don't necessarily have to result in fatalities that you actually can coexist if you know what you're doing. I don't want to bring the wrong impression across that this is just easy. You can just walk up to a polar bear. No, that certainly isn't the case. When I walk with bears, I do it in areas away from cities or towns up there, simply as I do not know what is the experience a bear has around town and that it changes the entire uh, situation. And also when I'm going to show you now in a few seconds, a clip with George and I, the theoretically all what I do is very, very simple. The crucial thing is timing is if you do it exactly the same thing at the wrong time, it has no impact. So to have really the minimum impact to interact with a bear that the bear gets out of the interaction feeling positive, you get out of the interaction without any harm. 
that's the key. Then you have bears that they try it once. They actually will not try again to interact. They do it once. And from then on, you can just observe them. You just get totally ignored by the bears. So this year is out of the sequence, out of the film that Peter and George did with me. And here we go. Here we go. Okay. If it gets off the grass, we have to make a step toward them. Walking towards a polar bear goes against every instinct. No. If we're wrong, we could be killed. Uh, he'll try to come again. So just look big. Yeah, when he when he tries to hook in, I make a little step towards him. You kind of want to keep the pressure a little bit on him. Now he tries to hook again a little bit. I put a little of pressure on him. That's amazing. You want to be dominant. Any kind of movement towards another bear is always dominant behavior. I'm steering him away. And now he's made up his mind. He's gone. He's gone without creating stress. So for me, the crucial part here is without creating stress. It was actually an interaction that the bear came out of without feeling stress. And that for my work and later on observing bears, I will not have that bear avoiding me. He will just do whatever he does normally. And I can keep observing and I can keep seeing what actually bears do. I think the biggest problem we're having with understanding polar bears is that we mostly don't see what they actually do normally in life. And we have to understand much, much better how they live uh, to protect them effectively, to protect their environment. Their life is not only the winter. Uh, winter actually has probably the most, least amount of impact by humans, but the summertime is also important to them. And that's where the potentially conflict with human interest comes in. And to understand what, how bears live in the summer, what they do in the summer is, is crucial for bear survival long term. And since then, I've, I've, I've gone all over up high Arctic, this is Northern Baffin Island. We actually watched polar bears with narwhals. Similar situation right, where actually the narwhals would be swimming right next to shore and polar bears would uh, try to jump on their back. We've seen one polar bear drag a narwhal to shore and then feeding on it. Um, so there is a lot more going on in the summer and polar bear protection is a year round thing. We can't just pretend oh, well, the, the winter is the most important part for them feeding. Summer is important too, and we have to protect their environment to make sure they make it through the summer. And we found areas in, like this is Ellesmere Island, uh, we found areas in Ellesmere Island where uh, nobody knew there was any polar bears, and here they were hunting belugas, were feeding on belugas. There's a group of belugas near an ice pond. Uh, and so personally, what for my future, I hope I can do a lot more research in bear behavior at the moment. We are at the proposal stage to continue work in the Arctic, determine where bears live at what time of the year, what do they feed on, what is important to them. And so we're looking for funding. It's, uh, obviously, it's very, very hard to fund anything in the high Arctic, it's just the expenses of getting there, logistical expenses are so high. But uh, so. I just wanted to give you some idea what I'm working on, what my interests are, and where I hopefully go towards the future again, do a lot more with polar bears, walking with them on the ground. And hopefully I'm able to work also with communities to try to find ways how peaceful coexistence is possible. I just want to emphasize that when people always come out like uh, how dangerous polar bears supposedly are, just try to remember that in the entire Arctic exploration, not a single person explorer was killed by a polar bear. Uh, plenty of polar bears were killed, but not a, nobody, no polar bear killed a person. And also the Inuit have lived with the polar bears for thousands of years. And whatever habitat would be attractive to a polar bear would also be attractive to an Inuit. Polar bears would focus on areas where there are seal stats where the Inuit would live. So if the polar bears were hunting people, there either would be no polar bear or no Inuit. So peaceful coexistence is possible, but we have to know more. We have to understand more. It's also, how do we develop the Arctic? We have to, and we really know very little about the Arctic. We only know glimpses. Uh, people don't usually stay long enough there, don't go to a lot of areas. 
uh, where the wildlife lives. And I think this is in, in desperate need, particularly with a global cli uh, climate change. As area becomes more and more easily accessible, uh, that we actually go there before it is altered, before there is damage done by the mining exploration, uh, oil exploration, gas exploration, or shipping. So this is where my work hopefully leads me, always assuming funding becomes available, uh, but it always has in the past, so I'm pretty positive that will also happen in the future. So thank you for your attention. I hope I gave you some new insights, some interests in, in this, and uh, I'm open, available for questions. Wonderful, thanks Matthias, that was incredible. The, um, you know, I've, I've always had an affinity for bears and, uh, and I'm always shocked at how much more I learn each time I hear something about um, all the different species of bears we have in North America. But tonight I learned a lot about polar bears. Uh, I'm gonna pass it off to, to the crowd that's here. I think there's quite a few still in the chat. My computer crashed and I had to restart, but I'm back. Um, but I see there's quite a few here. So if anyone wants to um, ask uh, Matthias a question, feel free to unmute your mic um, and, uh, and, uh, and say hello. Matthias, it was really, really great yes. seeing that. Uh, I recognize a lot of those photos, of course, some of them from Monument, uh, Monumental Island and from Northern um, uh, Manitoba, of course, and Northwest Passage. I believe there's about 17 individual polar bear populations around the world in Siberia, Svalbard, Canada, et cetera. Um, the, the Western, correct me if I'm wrong, but the Western Hudson Bay population seems to be doing okay. Um, which populations are most at risk? So uh, there's 19 recognized 19. Uh, population um, of the 19. Two are thought to be increasing, which one is the like population around Cambridge Bay. The other one is between uh, the Cane Basin that is between Ellesmere Island and, and Greenland. And there are four that are considered to be decreasing right now. And these are uh, the two in Northern Alaska and then the two Hudson Bay one, including Western Hudson Bay. So the Hudson Bay is in my opinion a bit complicated because what they do is compare truly numbers around Churchill. And Churchill has seen huge shift in availability of food. So that there is like Arviat, people in Arviat say they've seen more bears than they've ever seen before. And I think that's a lot of them are Churchill bears. Like Churchill until, what, 10 years ago still had a garbage dump that was closed. There was just more feeding going around uh, well, around Churchill that basically doesn't exist anymore and the bears have moved north and are, from what I have heard in Arviat, uh, they actually, to keep the bears out of town, they put uh, carcasses of wildlife south of town and that's where the bears congregate. So it, it's, it's tough to make uh, then really assessment of population because they may have shifted simply because food sources have shifted. Overall, the population numbers worldwide are still considered stable, but there is large uncertainty about that because a lot of population is simply isn't enough information on it. The other aspect is that, and like really proper polar bear protection or marine, marine mammal protection didn't come until about 1972. And so a lot of marine mammals have very long reproductive cycles. So before 1972, all these marine mammals would have been far below carrying capacity of a habitat. So you may still see stable populations, even though the habitat is decreasing because they never were at carrying capacity. So there might be a major impact that we see very soon, but we haven't seen it yet uh, because of, of this uh, carrying capacity issue. Uh, this is what people that then come with the argument that polar bears just adapt fine. I, I think they're really comparing apples with oranges. It, it is logical if you have a habitat that by any objective assessment is able to, to support fewer bears, that there will be fewer bears, that they just don't move to other food sources. Uh, I always say that 
uh, an elephant doesn't become a giraffe just because the habitat changes. So a polar bear doesn't become a black bear because there's other food sources available. Wonderful. Any other questions here in the Zoom chat? I know we have some questions coming from online. I see Marlies is uh, ask, going to ask a question. Go ahead, Mar Marlies. Yeah, hi. Uh, hi, Matthias. Um, I don't know if you know Jim Halfpenny um, up at the... Yeah. Uh, yeah, he was one of, he was one of my um, uh, sponsors to the Explorers Club. And um, I've actually traveled with him and a few times and other people as well, also up into the Western Arctic um, and have observed a few times in a place called Conningham Inlet where polar bears are actively hunting belugas. Um, and a lot of polar bears around, they're all wandering around and yeah, they behave each other. As you said, they are not aggressive to each other. Um, they um, take turns and uh, mothers with cubs in there also. Um, so uh, yeah. And there is, there's actually a few places like Cuttingham Inlet is one. I know of a couple of other places. Um, like the, for me, the interesting part is that uh, there probably are a good number more places we simply don't know about. And I think for us also as Explorers Club, it would be very important that we actually go out, explore more, and find more of these places to be able to also protect these places. I know of one, one uh, not too far away from Cunningham Inlet, it's still a few hundred miles, but there's every year uh, also belugas going into a bay. And the last time I was in there, there were 20 polar bears on the beach and about 12 beluga carcasses. And what I haven't been able to go back there in years, but uh, I would actually like to see whether this is a recurring event. And I would like to know whether then these kind of places could effectively be protected. They seem to be very important feeding places in the summer for polar bears. And they're simply really publicly not known. Yeah, I wonder if um, it would be helpful uh, looking at the geography, uh, like Conningham Inlet has a very specific geography that geography. makes it easier uh, to hunt um, belugas. They get trapped in there because of the geography of the inlet. Um, and I'm wondering if other places might be similar to that and if it would be useful look, to look for places like that as that have that type of geography, that that's maybe where to find bears. Well, this is one of the proposals I have. Like, I have two proposals right now out uh, that handing around trying to get funding. And that is actually what we're trying to do. We're trying to do an assessment of these territories and find out where there is population hotspots. Yeah. And particularly Cunningham Inlet because of Northwest Passage, that is going to be a major issue. Mm -hmm. uh, bear hunting that we actually keep these areas quite protected and safe as I believe they're crucial for bear survival. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, uh, Lizzie, uh, do you have a question? I do, yes. Um, thank you so much, Matthias. This was fantastic. Um, I'm curious, There, your pictures are absolutely stunning and beautiful, and your story painted a really wonderful picture of bears and that they're doing pretty well. Um, and I'm curious your thoughts on some of the images that are out there of kind of the emaciated bears and them coming in just into Churchill and being kind of seen as the, the trash bears um, and then connecting that with climate change and having them being like the, the key species that we need to protect in order to protect climate change. So I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, the problem is that uh, you basically invariably cannot make a statement from the fate of a single individual, uh, then extrapolate and say this is the whole population. So the bears have always died and old bears generally when they die are very emaciated. So to, and also a lot of juveniles like survival rate of juveniles, even in, in perfect climate conditions, I mean, not every bear survives as if otherwise they would overrun the Arctic. So you would always have emaciated things. Uh, you have to, so to take individual cases and then make statements for the whole population is always problematic. And that's where then the criticism comes in. The, 
when you see population trends, that's a different situation. So the, the main issue is that I have of these images, it usually shows adults or um, animals. Well, adult animals are really the one least impacted by climate change. It will be mostly, as I said, recruitment. So juveniles that just don't make it. And that's where the numbers go down. So you, you see then the, the people that come with, uh, oh yeah, climate change, look at the emaciated bear. And then the, there will be the next guy over that will fight the climate change debate and show the fat bear and say, well, this is proof that there is no climate change. Um, you just, but when I talk to locals, I mean, that's where I think the, the whole debate is changes then. And I asked locals and I said, well, have you seen any shift in like ice? And I said, oh yeah, big shift. We have one month, two months less ice. Then there is no argument. Then they will actually admit to it. When you come with, with polar bears, it gets problematic because then there come personal interests in, and uh, some people feel threatened. Some people don't see a reason why the species should be protected because it's like, I really, what I try to do is, uh, one thing is try to get this image away that polar bears are killers to get a more positive attitude of locals that you actually can live with polar bears and then look more at the habitat and the overall population it is there is if you have less ice there is less food there is fewer polar bears it's that simple the it's just as soon as you use a single individuals uh, it becomes a really problematic argument because ultimately you don't know what caused this particular individual to not find enough food. But overall, I mean, it, it's, it's pretty straightforward. It is warming, it is getting warmer. There's 50% less sea ice now than there was 50 years ago. And polar bears are marine hunters on sea ice. You have less sea ice, you have poorer conditions for bears and there will be fewer bears around. So far, population has not been impacted, but I think, in my opinion, within the next 10 years, we'll see major impact in a, a number of populations. Wonderful, well, well put, thanks for that. The, um, I know there's a few questions on from our, our YouTube channel that's running right now. Joe, would you be able to um, ask one of those? Yeah, absolutely. So we've got about 14 or so who are tuning in online. I'll just do a couple of little shout outs here. We've got Buzz and Rhonda joining us. Aubrey Whitaker is joining us. Uh, and Aubrey is wondering if there's any behavioral differences between populations of polar bears in say Canada, Alaska, Greenland, Russia, Svalbard. Well, I personally, do not think so. I'm always like I have not been to every single area and I have not encountered polar bears in every single population. Wherever I have encountered polar bears on the ground, behavior of the bears towards me and towards other bears have been more or less the same. Um, whenever I talk to people uh, that are in specific areas and I haven't been to, they say, well, this might be true for the bears where you are, but our bears are different. I have heard this line ever since I worked with bears, like for grizzlies, black bears, polar bears, it was whatever I tell them, well, this is what bears will do. This is how you can coexist. The, the message I get is, well, this might be true for the bears we used to work with, but our bears are different. I so far have never found that to be true. I think bears are just bears. If you have localized problems, localized, uh, like aggressive tendencies. I think it's due to certain experiences, lifetime experiences these bears have in these areas. And uh, I, I firmly believe if you analyze these situations, you could come up with a solution that will allow for peaceful coexistence. Wonderful. Does anyone else have any questions here on uh, Zoom or, or Joe, you can monitor YouTube? I've got another one uh, from YouTube and this one's about the cubs. So if there's a, you know, two to three cubs, how many of those are going to make it to adulthood on average? Well, on average, half of the cubs born don't make it to be released into independence. 
and then half of the ones that are released into independence don't make it to sexual maturity, meaning of about two thirds of the cups born don't become adults. However, averages are highly misleading. Like when I followed a lot of sows with cups, I found that some sows are very, very successful at raising every single litter, every single cup, and some sows uh, never learn it. They never get the hang of it. They lose every litter they have. And so I think it's just like in human societies, there are good mothers and there are bad mothers. And some of it is learned. Some sows get better over a lifetime. Some never get better. Some are from the start really good caretakers. Others are lousy. So the average, yes, two thirds dies, but uh, to put that on the individual gets really problematic. So there's huge individual differences. That's fascinating. Um, is there any more questions here in uh, Zoom? I thought I saw some hands. Oh, it's Peter. Hey there, Peter, go ahead. Sorry, Peter, just one sec. We're gonna have to uh, unmute you. Unfortunately, Zoom changed their settings so the host can't unmute anymore. Peter, if you look in the bottom left of your screen, uh, bottom left, you should see a microphone symbol and it says mute. If you click on that, uh, it should bring you back to us. It's one of Zoom's new security features, which is kind of a bummer when you're trying to host an event. Well, Peter's uh, talking about that. One uh, thing I was interested in, Matthias, I don't know if you've ever heard this, but in South America, I've, I've noticed that there's no real recorded killings of people by jaguars, uh, where in Africa, you know, the, the analog there, leopards do um, uh, have been known to kill people. I'm wondering if there's some sort of connection between um, how in Africa humans co-evolved with predators over, over potentially the last few hundred thousand and, and into the other hominins for millions of years, where in the Americas, humans are relatively novel to the environment. If that might have something where, the, where predators here don't see humans as a, with a prey signature? Uh, I personally think the, the relation is more the reverse. Uh, so in Africa, where predators and large uh, mammals co-evolved with man, uh, the megafauna really survived. They, uh, so you have elephants, you have giraffe and all that. Whereas the megafauna in the north, where humankind very recently showed up, they basically all died out, like uh, the mastodon, uh, mammoth, uh, wolver rhinoceros, and all of that. Um, I personally believe a predator that um, was preying on people was either eliminated um, or people wouldn't live there. But so polar bears lived with Inuit for thousands of years. So there is some kind of peaceful coexistence. If you have situations nowadays where predators prey on people, I, I think we have to look like most incidents, there are incidents in North America with mountain lions attacking people. And they have come up in recent years a little bit more frequently. And when every single case I'm familiar with, there is a human component to it. There is either that all is under natural food supply for this predator was gone. So you went for whatever else was available, which then may have included the person. Uh, there's often, like with mountain lions, what used to be the case is people would keep mountain lions illegally until they couldn't take care of them anymore and then let's let them go. And these mountain lions actually then never had the natural avoidance of, of people. So I don't know the particular case like with jaguars in, in South America compared to uh, uh, predators in, in Africa, but my guess would be that there is actually another reason that there is uh, possibly that an overhunting of the natural resource for the jaguar that he has no other choice anymore. Uh, or there might be some food conditioning going on. Uh, that is my guess. Cool. The, um, uh, it looks like Peter's online here. Uh, go ahead, Peter, with your question. Not a question, a statement. This guy seems very modest. I got to tell you, it's incredible to be out with polar bears 
with this guy. There are seven billion people on the world. There's only one that I would be with as close as he will get and in control with these bears. He's truly an amazing bear whisperer. So that's all I want to say. And I wholeheartedly second that. Well, thanks, George. Thanks, Peter. We should do another film. Okay. Maybe we will. Um, but I wanted to point out again, like, uh, the, the, the risk always is when people see you do something and say, oh, that's just easy. Um, it's like so many things. If you have a reasonable knowledge about a subject matter, you can make things look easy. And when people then uh, don't have that knowledge, try to do the very same thing, all of the thing, things just go way haywire. Um, I'm very selective how I work with the bears. I'm selective also the people I work with. Um, so like that, that I took George out was very much based that I could totally rely on George out there with me and also on Peter. There's a lot of things can go wrong. It appears like it's in total control, but uh, you know, there's a lot of things that can go wrong and you have to be aware of it. Uh, but it is possible. I, what I wanted to show in this film was that if you know what you're doing, it is possible. Coexistence is possible. You can actually see bears at a totally different level, but it, it takes some knowing what you're doing and knowing the bears. Does anyone else have any questions? I, I don't want to put you on the spot, Matthias, but oh, no, uh, go ahead, Brianna, I think. Yeah, I have to ask, has there been, what is the scariest? Like what was the scariest moment that you had with a bear or that you heard about? Was there any moment where you felt out of control like that? Well, you know, I, like I've taken people, a number of people, I sometimes get like the, the vice president of Google asked me to take him out. And, and so I, I take occasionally people out walking with bears. And my, before the first, the first time the bear interacts with me, that first moment is always, I'm always nervous. As soon as like when I was out there with George and then you see him and I said him, if he comes off the grass, we have to take a step towards him. As soon as that bear at that moment does a little sideway step, I know I won. But until then, I never know. I mean, that is you, you, you make your assessments, you, and, but you have your backups, you have your plan B and all of that. And so far I never had to use plan B, but then you know you won. And the only instances where I literally like the only polar bear instance, I literally uh, felt I had very little control with this one male that was a food condition male from Churchill that first year with that beluga bear and he kept charging. And uh, like saying that I was afraid that uh, right when it happens, you're so focused, you have no time to be afraid. Uh, you're afraid before and you're afraid after. Right when it happens, uh, didn't. And then you relive it at night and then it all comes back. But that was the scariest moment because uh, that bear was just not showing any normal behavior. Um, I had a friend of mine uh, guides people and he had a, an experience and I hope I'll never get into that experience. Uh, that one bear would charge a whole group of 15 people like full on charge and they would shoot cracker shells and everything off and he would come within like 30 yards, turn around, it off and then charge again. And it turns out that bear was actually just came out of tranquilization. So the tranquilizer they use is a derivative of ketamine. And when I talk to human uh, medicine, medical providers, they, they told me, oh yeah, this is not that rare a reaction in like in people, like there's like psychosis reaction to ketamine. And so this then again, like when I walk with bears, I want to be in an area where there is no other human interference, where I don't get situations such as like tranquilized bear 
but what do I do? If, like there's a bear like that that is on, on catamaran, um, I may have end up shooting it. And that's about the last thing I want to do in, in life is, is shoot a bear. And fortunately, it has never happened to me, but it's certainly something to consider. And it's also something to consider for bear management to what degree tranquilization actually creates some of the problems that we have around Arctic communities where they will tranquilize bears that have been problem bears, move them whatever amount of miles away. Uh, but uh, the experience that these bears had and the drugs they were under may cause very undesirable effects and may cause problems that then result in many more problems. Like we had a couple of people killed or three people killed, I believe in Nunavut three years ago and the result was then that there was actually a push to call, call polar bears. And um, I don't know the individual instances, how, why these, these fatalities came about, but uh, just past experience tells me there's always a human element in it. So, fortunately, I, as I said, I haven't had these experiences, but I'm always aware that they can happen. And I, so every bear encounter, even if like Peter and George feel like I'm totally in control, the first minute I'm always anxious. I'm not necessarily afraid, but I'm anxious. And then when I see the first reaction, then oh, oh, everything is fine. I can keep that under control. Now you tell us. Thanks a lot. <laughs> but I always have plan B, Peter. I always have plan B. <laughs> and the what ifs after the fact are always the worst. Yeah. Well, There's but no I think answer that, to what if. Like a, a number of uh, friends, people I know have gotten killed by bears over the years and uh, are not polar bears, grizzlies, but uh, basically the common theme is one thing is that they never had a plan B. So they always assume things are always the same. Uh, I always keep that there is other options. Uh, I don't, I try to avoid surprise encounters by all means and try to keep uh, stress level among the people down because bears react to people's behavior, whether we realize how we behave or not. So if we react confidently as a group, there really isn't that big a problem. Uh, if you do stupid things, you may entice a bear reaction. It, another thing, Peter, like we were four people or five, uh, there never has been a bear attack on a on a group four or five. So being on your own, and I've done like filming, I've done this with another person, it, it gets sometimes, well, it doesn't necessarily get more dangerous, but uh, the bears get sometimes a bit uh, more inquisitive. So. What about those people, the McNairs, Sarah McNair, that was attacked in their tent in the Arctic? What did they do wrong? Uh, I don't think they did anything wrong from, uh, I assume you're referring to that uh, on at the mouth of the Turner River, where they were get out of the, the tent and killed. I, I don't know where it was, but I, I know that yeah. the tent, tent was attacked by a bear. Yes, and I believe that in the aftermath, if we're talking about the same incident, that bear was a food conditioned bear from a village that was a 50 miles away but that bear was actually known in that village as being a, a garbage bear so uh, like when we went walking with the polar bears i on purpose where we went to was a population that really has no interaction with any village there's no village nearby these bears go to so that i have good prediction that these are not food conditioned bears these are not garbage bears like I try to basically put all the odds in my favor. I don't like to roll the dice too much. Matthias, I don't want to put you on the spot, but um, seeing as you're a world expert on bears and polar bears, and and you're and you're have a, a fantastic mission of trying to spread a, a new positive message about what bears are actually like. Um, is there one sort of take-home message? about bear conservation that you would you would like to leave us some, like maybe something that I don't know if there's something we could all do because that's a hard thing to answer but is there a, a take-home message regarding bear conservation in the north um, 
um, that you would like to leave us with? Uh, well, I mean, it's a long message that I think our perception of bears is wrong. We have the general perception of bears being grumpy, recluse, that really are asocial and potentially aggressive and all of that. And I think all of that is wrong. Uh, they actually are quite social. Um, I think the, the one message I have, coexistence is possible. It is a matter of uh, resolve on our part. It is up to us whether we coexist with the bear. It is not really up to the bear. If we do the right thing, uh, we can coexist with the bears and provide them with an environment that is safe for both us and them. Well, thank you very much. That was um, nothing short of incredible. The, your, your, your photos, your knowledge uh, was very much appreciated. I think everyone here very, I can see a lot of heads nodding and some smiles. <laughs> Uh, everyone was really into it and uh, we're excited. So I'm sure you got a whole bunch of new followers going to follow your work and see uh, see your next stuff. Uh, I, I know that that Grizzly book, when does the Grizzly book come out? Is it out now? Well, it is done. Um, I have it now out as an ebook e right now. Like I mostly, my books sell really in the tourist season and there is no tourist season this year. So I postponed the printing until this fall. Well, I spent $30,000 on printing a book right now, and there's nobody buying it presently. Um, but yeah, it's available as an ebook. Just go to my website, contact me, and uh, it's, it's possible to purchase and get right away. And what I'll do also, because as I said, I don't print right now, is uh, anyone that wants it as an ebook and they buy right later on the hard copy, I actually reimburse them for all the ebook costs. Wonderful. Well, there you have it. So fall comes, that means great Christmas presents for everybody to send to all their family. So all of you can buy your book and, uh, and uh, or two, because you need to send the Christmas present to someone else you love. Um, th thank you very much, Matthias. This was incredible. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to spend with us and uh, those across Canada who are listening and some uh, in the US as well. Um, and I want to thank uh, Joe Grabowski from Exploring by the Sea Your Pants for, again, hosting this and clicking all the buttons and making sure everyone's on camera. Uh, that uh, is very much appreciated. Uh, George, if there's anything else you wanted to say, otherwise we'll, we'll uh, head on out. No, just thank you everyone for uh, taking your Friday evening to uh, spend with us. Thank you very much, Matthias. Great to see you again. I look forward to our next adventure. So do I. Go well, everyone. Take care.